Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. There's this wonderful spirit here. As I was standing there worshiping God, I just love when God does this. He began to speak to my heart about being weary and well-doing. We should be weary in what we're doing for God. Amen. Um, our redemption draws nigh. Amen. One of these days we'll be with Jesus. And that's what I'm living for. I'm, I'm so glad I'm not wasting my life and God has called me for a purpose. There's something about a purpose. It's, it's, it's a blessing to have a purpose. Amen. You know, I, I really feel sorry sometimes for people when they just, they're just wandering through life aimlessly. They have no purpose. They have no direction. They have nothing that they're living for. But as a child of God, you're living for something. Amen. Amen. We're living this life to live again. This is the dressing room for eternity. And not only that, God wants us to reach people. I often say that, and I was praying about that this morning, how, about how a soul winner is close to, close to God's heart. If you reach people for God's kingdom, you're close to God. God's close to you. You think about you. you, you a lot of us have one child that does a lot of stuff. That child's close to you, isn't he? I can get a responsibility to so-and-so because I know they're going to do it right. Or I can make sure I count on this one and I can give them directions and they'll get it done right. And that child is close to the same thing with us. Well, we're God's children and we work for his kingdom. We're close to God and he's close to us. So just never think about, I mean, just think about that and, and never forget that as a, as a soul winner, as somebody who believes in God and, and wants others to be saved, you should be out there trying to reach people for God's kingdom. Amen. And it don't have to be a great grand thing. Everybody's not called and everybody doesn't have that gift of, of just evangelism. They can go and go into a neighborhood and just reach everybody there. Everybody doesn't have that particular gift. But, but you can speak to somebody. Whether it's a coworker, whether it's a friend, whether it's a neighbor, I've always had. Um, my first pastor used to always challenge us in, um, about our Christianity. He was always he was one of them them pastors that convicts you. You just be around him, it just convicts you with his life and some of the things that he said. And, and he said something to me when I first got saved, and I never forgot it. He said, "If you can't convince the people that live right next to you, next door to you, to serve God and to come to church, then what kind of relationship with God do you have? They live right next to you." Hey, man, I got some of my neighbors here. <laughs> They've been here with us for years. <laughs> Every time I go somewhere, I try, I try to reach my neighbor for Christ. So that, that, mean, that means you got to do right. That means you got to cut the grass sometime. Amen? <laughs> that means when you barbecue, you need to go take them a, a bone or two or something like that. That, that, that. that means just being a blessing, being a neighbor. Well, preach, who is my neighbor? Everybody. Everybody's your neighbor. But the people that live closest to you and the people that we're in direct relationship and contact with, we should be able to convince them for God. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm excited about what God is doing. Amen. I'm looking forward to that spiritual campaign. Don't waste your life. A life that's not lived for Christ is a life that's wasted. No matter what you do, you could be a celebrity, you can make millions of dollars, you can be a, a professional football player, an athlete, get championships, do all these wonderful things. But when you stand before God, what is that really going to mean? God don't care about that junk. I know that's not good English, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Amen. He doesn't really care about that. What he cares about is what you've done with your life. How many people you talk to, uh, your relationship with him. That's the most important thing, your relationship with him. Because you can have bad relationships with people, but a good relationship with God. And eventually that will change. Amen. Amen. I right, praise God. Let me go on because I can tell y'all. Preacher, get on with the message. I am. I am. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad to see everybody today. It's good to um, be in God's presence, God's house. Um, again, reach out to people. Reach out to those that are lost. Because you pass them every day. Say, Preacher, well, I don't know the relationship with God. Well, see. Find out. Talk to them. You know, there's a lot of people out there that's looking for God, but they have no Christian example. All right, so today we're going to talk about, we've been going through this um, spiritual growth series, and I'm going to continue on with that. Um, the last couple of weeks we talked about, um, I've, I've just divided this in sections. We talked about the evaluation, amen, um, whether you're a carnal Christian or a mature Christian, or you're a baby Christian. I didn't preach a message on that because that's kind of self-explanatory. When you first start off in the faith, you're a baby Christian. You have to grow. Um, but the evaluation part is over, so you should be able to tell by looking at your own life, whether I'm a carnal Christian or I'm a mature Christian. And you have to do that. You have to evaluate yourself. Don't lie to yourself. The biggest deception that a person can make is by lying to themselves. 
Don't lie to yourself. If you can't sing, it's okay. You can't sing. I embrace that. I'll make fun of myself. As a matter of fact, when we were singing worship, I kind of, there was a pause where it wasn't too loud, and I heard myself sing. I said, let me shut up, because <laughs> I, I can't sing well. Amen. But realize, be honest with who you are, because you can never grow when you're not honest with yourself. You meet people, and they think they got it, but they don't have it. Amen. So be honest with yourself. So we already went through that. Um, we talked about those who are spiritually mature, and we talked about um, those who are carnal. Carnal Christians mean being like the world. Not a Christian in your lifestyle, but just a Christian indeed. I know when I was um, in the military, we had dog tags. And I was, I was raised a Baptist. Amen? Um, and as a Baptist, you, that's the first thing you say. Hey, wh- wh- um, how, how's your relationship with God? I'm, I'm a Baptist. That's not, that has nothing to do with your relationship with God. That's a, a tag that you put over the door. Amen. I find, well, I don't really go. All right. So the evaluation part of it, but now we're talking about the application part. So I, I pray that you had a, um, an outline or whatever, or a message, whom the message knows. But I just want to make sure if people don't know that on the back of this, there's a, that little QR code. Everything is digital now. So you have to just get with the program. Amen. I got to get with it myself. But that little thing right there, you can just scan that, and, and there's a study that we do. To grow, amen, because because God doesn't just want you to just sit at church on Sunday morning and um, pay your time uh, or, or give your time and drop your dime. He wants you to be engaged all throughout the week. So that's something that you can go on and you can look at and you can um, and use that to, to develop your relationship with God. Because doing things for God and being a Christian is not just a Sunday morning event. We have to learn. We have to get that in our, our, our psyche. We have to get that in our heart. Just like being black is not a, a one day a week thing. You're black all the time. Or you are whatever race you are, you're whatever, you don't change that. Unless you go in the mirror and paint yourself or whatever. I remember Eddie Murphy did that one time. But anyway, I'm, yeah. <laughs> he walked through the world as, as a white guy. That was kind of, it was funny. But that, that's a little humor. But, um, but you're that all the time. And the same thing as a Christian. You're a Christian all the time. You're not a chameleon. Blend into your environment. Blend into your surroundings. That little lizard with the little bug eyes, and anything that he's around, he can blend into that. That's not what God called us to be. God called us to be the same. How many of y'all like fake stuff? Fake gold, fake Rolexes, fake this, fake that. Who likes to fake? Nobody likes to fake stuff. Get the real thing. And you know, God doesn't like fake Christians. He wants a real Christian. Somebody that you don't have to look at their feet tell which way they're going because they're faking you out. God don't want that. You have to be what God wants you to be. Instant. Be the same. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We should be the same. I'm not saying that you shouldn't evolve and grow, but God wants you to be the same. Amen. So now we're going to talk about um, signs of spiritual growth or indicators of spiritual growth in your life. Now for everything there should be indicators. There's indicators. Some of y'all from the old school, when you, you know, when they, they had cars and they would have these little things, they look like um, antennas on the side of your of your, your wheel well. Some of y'all know what you're talking about. It's like curve feelers. Some of y'all may be old enough when you had that deuce in the quarter, diving in the back, sun, root, side, dick. Well, anyway. Yeah, but you, you have those things on the car and then you get close to a curve. Brother, but you know what I'm talking about. It hits the curve. It, it, it lets you know that you're near a curve. That's the indicator to let you know that you're near a curve. So spiritual growth, there's indicators in our life to let us know that we're growing spiritually. So today I'm going to go over some of these indicators. Now these aren't aren't meant to jack you up or make you feel bad, but it's to make us change. I know as a coach, we watch film on practice. We watch film on the games. And these things are designed to teach us what we're doing wrong so we can fix them. There's something about problems when problems continue to linger and people don't make the effort to fix them. Amen? Yeah, you may have messed up a relationship, but fix whatever you did in that relationship because it's not always somebody else's fault. Fix your problem. Fix yourself. Look at you and make sure that you're doing the right thing so when the next relationship comes that you can fix that and you can go on from there. That's how we grow. And it's just like spiritual indicators. So indicators of spiritual growth in your life because everybody has them and we can glean something from that. All right, so we're going to use a scripture text. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12, um, verses 9 through 
12, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. Now, I love this portion of scripture because the Apostle Paul was, was teaching to a church, teaching to a church in Rome. And, you know, these, these different people that he taught, they had to go through a lot of different things. Um, I'll often say that I believe that the Apostle Paul had one of the hardest jobs in the Bible because he had to teach these people that were so used to doing things a certain way how now you have to do it another way. Because change is hard. Amen? It's hard for everybody. And the older I get, the more I realize that it's hard to change. But I think change is something that we have to be able to adapt to because everything around us is changing. I was just telling the sisters a, a little while ago before service started how I went to Los Angeles to visit my uncle. And he was, um, he took me all throughout the city and he was showing me the evidence of change. And he was showing me the different neighborhoods and how, how things are changing, how the gentrification process is actually happening. When they build stadiums, they're building that, that stadium, well not building it, it's there now. In Inglewood, the stadium for the Chargers, and, and when they build all these different things, and, and it's, it's a culture shock for some people. Some people are getting money and running, and some people are evaluating what they need to do. They're making plans. They're doing things. But he was riding me through all the different neighborhoods, and, and you see, um, now where else do you see this? Church's Chicken and Starbucks on the next corner. Starbucks is relatively a new thing. Amen. Or, or Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, and then you got this other place right around the street. So all of these different things. And I remember, remember some of y'all remember the, the old soul food restaurant, M&M's? M&M's ain't there no more. Even though I don't think they had no good soul food. Anyway, it was all right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I asked for some oxtails one time. I was like, this is what y'all got? Y'all need to go to Alabama. Anyway, um. Yeah, but things are changing. We live in a world where things are constantly changing. And if you've been in this neighborhood or this community for a while, you see that things are changing. People are moving from other areas. And I really believe, Saints and Lighthouse, that there's a reason why we're here as a church. There's a reason why God called me to this city and God called us to this city because it's not just me. We're a body, amen? We're a group of believers, and God called us to this city to reach our people, amen? He called us to this city to reach those that lost, and we need to go out in those streets, and we need to talk to people about Jesus. We need to tell them that there's a better way, and with a new time, uh, with a new space, uh, with a new community, there's new opportunities to serve God. We have to let people know that. Because be honest with you, the biggest fight that most people have is when change takes place. When there's a big change in your life, the devil's going to fight you hard. You know how many people I meet when I'm out in the streets and I talk to them, they say, oh man, I used to be, when I lived in L.A., I used to go to so and old church, I used to do this. And, I and I'm like, well, where are you going now? Well, I kind of got away from it. Why? Because that change took place and the devil stepped in. Amen? And that happens sometimes in our lives. When that change takes place, the devil will step in and try to pull you away from God. And that's any change. You get a new job, the devil's going to step in and try to pull you away from God. You can get more overtime. You can make more money. But what about when you're at the, the cooler getting water and that young lady comes and tries to talk? Come on now. Talking about change. He wants to step in when there's change. Every time when you read scripture, when you look at all the kings of Israel and of Judah, one of the things that would happen was the people would get most wicked when there was a change of leadership, when there was a change of um, um, the different things that happened, when they were taken over by a certain group of people, then they would step in, the devil would come in, and he would convince the people to start serving false gods. It always happened. Nowadays, though, we don't set up little images, the false god that we serve usually is self. It's all about me. That's why one of the things I despise, Charles, the most about gospel music today is because they take the focus and the emphasis off of God and they put it on you. I just want to be happy. What about the relationship with God? I just want to go get your blessing. What about blessing everybody else? Amen? We don't focus on everything else. We focus on just us. And that's a form of idolatry. It's not all about you. 
Say, preacher, go. I will. Amen. All right, so signs of spiritual growth are indicators of spiritual growth in your life. Romans chapter 12, I'm going to start reading at verse 9, then I'm just going to go to verse 12, and then we'll stop there. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Father, right now we just thank you for the word of God. We thank you for each one that's here. God, we just want to say a special prayer for the saints, God, who may be sick, those who are infirm, God, those who aren't here today and they couldn't be here for what reason or the other. We just pray, God, for that special hedge of protection that you promised around the believers to be around them. We just pray for your blessing today, God. Let us always look to indicators of our spiritual growth so we can get closer to you, so we can be more like Jesus. God, that's why we're here today is to receive the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Give us strength, give us power. God, empower us to reach our community for you. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So again, we went through the evaluation process. We talked about if you were a carnal Christian or a mature Christian. Now we're talking about the application process. And then there's another process that we're going to go through, and that's um, whether you're um, it, well, I'll, I'll get that later. Amen. But I'm, I'm not even going to finish this message now. I'm already like 12 minutes in, and I ain't even really started to. <laughs> anyway, amen. You know, sometimes, and that, again, that's another thing about change. You have to evaluate where you're at, what you're doing. This morning, I was just thinking about one of the most, the things that I hated the most about church, I found myself doing as a pastor. Standing up behind a pulpit all day to say the same thing. I used to be, I'm like, come on, dude. How many times, what different ways you going to say that? <laughs> as a child, I used, I'm like, man, we don't have to be here all day. But anyway. Some of y'all remember what I'm talking about. You get to church, you're there all day, and the Baptist training union was after that, and then there was the fish fry, and then there was the love offering, the joy offering, the benevolent offering, the, the passing these, the new pair of shoes offering, and then and the bake sale, and then somebody got up and read the announcement, and then there was a selection from the youth choir, a selection from the adults choir, and then you had the seniors choir, and then, no, no, don't forget about that. What about the anniversary of so-and-so, and the passing these, that done, and now we're in this part of the, the announcement, now some Somebody wants to read a poem. We don't want to do that. Hey Amen. It was like, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? We were there all day. <laughs> that was one of the things I used to hate the most about church. Because I knew we were going to be there all day. And then after that, your dad stands around and talks for 30 years about the same old thing. Hey, remember? Like, man, I, I, didn't, I, I can quote this story, but anyway. You just a kid, you just stand there, somebody give you a peppermint and pat you on the head, you okay. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Remember the ladies used to have the peppermints in their purse all the time? They pull them out and sometimes they'd be at 20 years, have a piece of hair on it and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just take the hair off and pop the peppermint and keep rolling. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But indicators of spiritual growth in my life. All right, so one indicator of spiritual growth in your life is that your ability to love increases. Your ability to love increases. And that can be found in verse 9 of Romans chapter 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. Now, that's a big statement because sometimes people are fair weather friends. They love you when things are good. When the money runs out, and that's the thing a lot of children don't understand, this young generation coming up, when the lights go down, when the money runs out, amen, when you stop having the little five on it and all that kind of stuff, when, um, when you know, everybody got their cut but they ain't chipped in, when all that kind of stuff runs out, amen, then that's when people are gone because they love you because you're doing something for them. 
The Bible tells us to love without hypocrisy. Love people beyond what you think that love should be. Love them beyond where they are because let the truth be told, at some point in life, the money's going to run out. You're not going to be able to do what you used to do. You may not be able to babysit the kids no more, amen? You may not be able to give you a couple of dollars on, on what's happening in your life. You may not be able to give them a ride to work no more. Then you don't get mad. Then you don't get upset. Then you look at that person and say, brother, sister, I understand. I know that life changes. I still love you anyway, and I'm on your side. When do we get to the place in life where we start hating people just because they don't agree with us? Everybody doesn't have to agree with you. But people have that problem, Floyd, because you don't agree with them, they hate you. They count you as an enemy. Or they'll stop being your friend or they won't walk with you anymore. No, I'm not going to do it no more. I quit because you don't agree. That's the problem. One thing I appreciate the most about Deacon Roberts, Deacon Roberts, if that's something, and, and, I, and I told the leadership this from the first time, from the, when, when this church was established. I said, guys, you may not agree with everything that, I, that comes up. I'm going to tell you right now, some of the stuff I don't even understand. And learn that about God. You may not agree with everything God tells you to do. As a matter of fact, a lot of the stuff you're not going to agree with because it goes against what you want to do. Again, talking about that selfish nature, it goes against what you want to do. I can, I'll tell you this beyond a shadow of a doubt. You can always tell it's God when he calls you out of your comfort zone, when he wants you to make a sacrifice, when you got to exert some energy, when you got to go beyond what you normally do. You can always tell it's God. Give that person a ride. But I was going that way, Lord. That was him telling you to do that. Amen. But love without hypocrisy. Love should be without hypocrisy. You don't love people just because they're doing something for you. You don't love people just because they're the same color as you. Folks, I'm going to tell you this. I've told you this before. I don't care how much you raise your hands in church. I don't care how much you shout amen. I don't care how much you, you um, do the jig and jump on the floor and, and have folks throwing blankets over you. I don't care about none of that. If you're prejudiced in your heart, you will not make it into God's kingdom. You're not going. Because you'll be up there fighting with folks. Because guess what? My Bible says in the book of Revelation that I saw a number that no man could number. And it wasn't 144,000 either. It said of no man could number of all nations, of, of all kindreds, of all tribes, of all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So if you're present, you might as well not go because you're not going to like everybody to stare. Amen. It kills me that people try to make Jesus what they want him to be. Jesus wasn't black. I remember one time I shot people in church. I broke down the scripture. I said, okay, people always use this scripture to say that Jesus was black. He had hair like wool. His hair was white like wool. And this is what I said, Alvin. White is not a texture. White is a color. Your hair's nappy like brown. That's, that doesn't sound right, does That's not right. White is a color. It's not a texture. Meaning his hair was white like wool. Not that it was nappy. Whatever. Y'all ain't here today, amen. And somebody pulled me aside at church, after church and said, Pastor, I never saw it like that. I said, it's right in the scripture. White is a color. It's not a texture. People read into the Bible more and put what they want in there. Jesus was Jewish. He wasn't black. He wasn't white. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Amen. So that picture that your mama had with right next to that fork and spoon that everybody had, that, that's the wrong picture of Jesus. 
I don't know who that dude is, but that wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Your ability to love should increase. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So in other words, if you don't love people, you're not born of God and you don't know God. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all, all fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. That's how you know when you have a strong love for God, because you're not afraid. Would you put your child in harm's way? And neither does God put us in harm's way. Through walking around scared, COVID is COVID, and I'm telling you something, it ain't over. The new thing is coming out, the new strand or the new variant or whatever that is. Where's your, you, are people that's afraid? What you going to go back and lock everything up and go back? I'm not afraid of that junk. If it kill me, it kill me. Ain't nothing you can do about it. I'm not going to walk around with a helmet on or, and, 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 and a big coat and walking around with hand sanitizer like a gun on my hip. Ah, somebody touch me. No. Why? I'm not afraid. My Bible still tells me if you drink anything deadly or poisonous, that it won't hurt you when you're God's child. Not saying that you go around drinking poison junk either. Like some of them snake handling churches. Oh, oh and the snake bit them and they die. Oh, I guess he didn't have enough faith. Well, <laughs> I ain't going to have enough faith because I ain't picking up no snakes. Amen. This goes to show you how people grossly misinterpret Scripture. Foods and, well, I don't want to call them foods, but they, well, praise God. Your ability to love should increase. All right, the second thing you need to look at when we're talking about indicators of spiritual growth, my hatred for sin and unrighteousness should grow. My hatred for sin and unrighteousness should grow. That means you don't want to be around it. That means you don't want to look at it. That means you don't, you don't enjoy consuming it. Some of the times, some of the movies and some of the things we watch, it just glorifies sin. Amen? We look at these things and it glorifies sin. And that's why sometimes people used to watch certain movies and they would try to come out as a gangster or something. I'm like, bro, you ain't no gangster. I always tell y'all about a guy that I, that a friend of mine would tell me about a, somebody he, he went to school with and they called the guy gangster nerd. Because <laughs> he dressed like a gangster and stuff. He said, but when you saw him going home, he had like all these books and he had all this stuff. He wanted to make sure he got his work. He was called him gangster nerd. <laughs> Amen. Because the true gangster didn't bring books. Amen. They were like, forget that. Whatever happens, happens. But no, it's, it's. But as a Christian, you make sure that you have a hatred for sin and unrighteousness. That should grow. When you see injustice, it should bother you. And that's no matter what kind of injustice it is. I always tell people, whether it's injustice or a racial injustice, whether it's a financial injustice, whether it's a spiritual injustice, whether it's a physical injustice, you should hate that type of stuff. Like churches with a man up behind a pulpit wants everybody to serve him. Comes in with his long robe and people are, oh, pastor, can I get, oh, it's over there. They just do, they got their finger train. It's over there. Yeah. Uh, get my, and they ain't got the nerve to have an attitude with it, Floyd. I told you to get my Bible. Get your own stinking Bible. I throw it at them. I, that, I'm different, man. I don't know. They order people around just like that. What is that? That should bother you. I understand you're supposed to respect the man of God. I get that. Amen. But but sometimes respect begets respect. You're not going to talk to me like I'm trash and think I'm going to just worship the ground you walk on. It ain't going to happen. I tell you behind the kicks rock somewhere. I've actually had quite, I've had 
say that to people. One time, I'm like, dude, who you think you're talking to? I'm like a child. Don't you know who I am? I don't care who you are. Respect me if you want to get respected. If not, get out of my face. And you don't have to be nasty about it. Just tell them. Amen. I remember Coach Avery said one time, hey, say, hey, you ain't going to talk to me like that. I have a job. I'm tired. <laughs> I go back home. Amen. Y'all don't know who Coach Avery is. He's here. Amen. I pray that. But hey, you respect the guest respect. But your hatred for sin and unrighteousness should increase. My Bible said that as a servant of God, you should be a servant of the people. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And I came to give my life a ransom. So what happened behind the disconnect from when Christ was on earth and the preachers of nowadays when they think everybody needs to serve them? We have a function. I, I, I let everybody else eat first. They have to make me go, go preach it. Pass it on over there. I'm like, man, I, I'm, I'm not here to be served. I can get it myself. Amen. Praise God. All right. So your hatred for sin and unrighteousness should increase. And that's found in verse 9 also. Abhor to what is evil. Cling to what is good. So you should hate evil things, and you should be trying to embrace things that are right. Nowadays, if you want to speak up for what's right, if you stand for what's right, everybody will isolate you. They don't want to hear it. They'll put you aside. Or oh, he's an old fuddy-duddy. He don't know what he's talking about. But the thing is, is that you should, as a Christian, as a child of God, as somebody who embraces what's right, you should encourage that person. Hey, brother, what you did was the right thing. What you said was right, because nobody's on their side. When did it ha come to place, and when did it happen in this world where when you do the right thing, people persecute you and talk about you? But nowadays, that's what happens. Your hatred for sin and unrighteousness should grow. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Uh-oh, y'all, they didn't start the clock, so I guess I got more time. All right. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way. And to pervert, I'm sorry, and the perverted mouth I hate. Pride and arrogance and the evil way. We, we, we celebrate people like that nowadays. Well, y'all celebrate folks like that. I'm not celebrating no arrogant joker. Amen? When somebody who was just kicked out of office that was straight up proud, arrogant, divisive, but you travel to places in the country and they're trying to get him reelected for the next term. I'm not voting for that. You do what you want to do. Amen? But the Bible tells you you should hate pride. You should hate arrogance. You should hate that kind of stuff. That's what the Bible says. Now, don't get me wrong, God is the one that sets up kings, and God is the one that takes them down. So he was there for a reason. I don't know what it was, but it was for something. Amen. But you should hate these things, unrighteous, unrighteousness, arrogance, pride. The fear of the Lord is to hate these things. Psalm 26, verse 5. I love this. David spoke this. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Well, that was my boy, and we grew up together, but he's stinking wicked. Really? How can you sit there and break bread with people and, and have them over your house and be chummy, chummy with them? And they're obviously against God. They're obviously against what you believe in. And if you're a follower of Christ, they're obviously against what's right. They're, and I get it if you're trying to win them for Christ or something, but there's something to be said about that. When they're obviously standing there talking trash to your face about the God you serve, to me that's a problem. Now, you can do what you want to do in the street, but you ain't doing it in my house. 
And I have teenagers. Amen. And they try to try to bring that junk in the house and some of that crazy music. I said, no, bro, you ain't going to play that in here. I turn the whole internet off. Try me. Because I don't need it. I can live without it. So if it's going to be a problem that you made, I can turn it off. Amen? See, I'm from the old school when, when your parents would take the door off the hinges. <laughs> Amen? You start talking some trash, talking about, oh, mama, I need some privacy. Okay, I got your privacy. She'll go right in there with a screwdriver and take the door off the hinges. Now, nah, privacy that. What you going to do? Apologize? Well, preacher, I think kids deserve their privacy. There's nothing you have that I should not have access to. When you get that grown, then you need to leave my home. I didn't mean for it to rhyme, but it did. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So your hatred for sin and unrighteousness should increase. All right, number three, talking about indicators of spiritual growth in my life. I am committed to God's people. I am committed to God's people. That's the indicator of spiritual growth in your life, when you're committed to God's people. Now, that can be found in, um, in verse 10 of Romans chapter 12. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Devotion. Amen. I'm going to say that word again. Devotion. That's something that's missing in our culture. People don't want to be devoted to anything. Wherever they start, they're looking for a way out so they can quit. And you can make a good excuse and find a good excuse. But as a Christian, you understand that your devotion should mean something. People should be able to say, if I don't say nothing else about that guy, the least thing I can say about him is that he's faithful. They should be able to say that. But nowadays, one of the most, the highest rates of divorce is in the Christian community. Did you know that? It talks about spiritual maturity. It talks about indicators of spiritual growth. We live in a day and age now where, where grown men with beards are sitting in the, in, the, in the pews, but they sucking on baby bottles because they're spiritually babies. Any little thing ruffles your feathers. It was two degrees hot, so I'm going to another church. Somebody looked at me wrong, so I need to go to another church. Big sissy. I shouldn't have said that, sorry, amen. <laughs> All right, praise God. I am committed to God's people. Again, that's in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. All right, so Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, that's the reason why I put that in there. Because the marriage union should mirror our relationship and our closeness and the church's relationship to Christ. He loved himself, he loved us so much that he gave himself for us. And if you're re, um, in a relationship with somebody, a marital relationship, you should be devoted to that person. People leave for anything. And it's crazy because they usually don't even go up. They go down. I know a guy that um, got a divorce, man. He was talking about it, how, how hard it was. He said, man, I should have stayed with who I was with. This lady I married can't even boil water. At least my ex-wife could cook. Won't do no laundry, won't clean up. But she looked good, though. You keep that junk. <laughs> Let's don't fill my stomach. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let go. On. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But you should leave your mother and father. Now look at that. That's a transfer of responsibility. 
That's one thing that we don't look at. There's a transfer of responsibility. There's a reason why when you go down the aisle with your, um, your, your, your dad supposed to have your, your, uh, the, the, the bride and he walks her down the aisle, that's ceremonial of I'm trading and I'm transferring my relationship, my, my, not my ownership, but my, 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 my dedication to you, and I'm transferring that over to your husband. That's what that symbolizes. No longer are you under my um, care as a, he's, now you you're still dad, amen? But, but no longer are you under my authority, but you're now under the authority of your husband. And I know ladies don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. That's the way God established it. And the reason why marriages aren't working is because people think they have a better way. God's word is always right. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you think. I don't care what, your, uh, what somebody else told you. God's word is always right. God is never wrong. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, stimulate one another. If your brother and sister can't make a comment to you about something that, that needs to change in your life or, or have accountability to you, then there's something wrong. You shouldn't be all in your feelings like that. Now, don't get me wrong, there's lines that you shouldn't step over. When I was a church member at a certain church, I told this dude, I said, dude, when did, when did the pastor die and you became the pastor? I ain't listening to you. I don't know, I was always the su supposedly nonconformist and all that kind of stuff. When I was in the dorms and seminary and stuff, they would come, they'd come up with these rules and laws. I said, man, I ain't following that junk. Oh, you know Brother Thomas, he ain't going to do nothing. Yeah, not because you said it. Who gave you authority? And the problem is everybody now wants authority. Everybody wants to be the big dog. Too many chiefs and not enough. Amen. Y'all already know the saying. Everybody wants to be in charge. But until you're in charge, get out of my face. Amen. I take my orders from the Lord. Amen. All right, so Hebrew, again, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good works, not to stimulate one another to sin and unrighteousness. If somebody corners you and starts talking trash about what's going on in the church, why don't you check them? Because that would bother me. Who do you think I am that I want to listen to your gossip? Because the Bible tells you not to be a partaker in somebody else's sin, right? So if that guy is gossip a sin, is slander a sin, is bearing false witness a sin, so when you stand there and you want to hear it because it's juicy and it sounds like the young and the restless, and you're a part of that. Man, I cut you off in a minute. I don't want to hear that. Have you told them that? Again, there's always a nice way to say it. I'd be like, well, brother, did you tell him that? That's a nice way to say it. Well, maybe you should let them know what you, what you think. Amen. I can add nice to it. I'm just kidding. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But commitment to God's people, that's an indicator of spiritual growth in my life. I'm committed to God's people and to God's church because you're a part of the body. The Apostle Paul himself symbolized all of that. He talked about the body, the body of Christ. Amen. That's what the church is. Every church is like a body. How would you feel if your arm said, I'm just going to stay home today? <laughs> How would you feel if your legs said, well, I just don't feel like going today. I know you're going, and then you got to drag it along everywhere you go. That wouldn't go over too well, would it? Amen. But the same thing in the body of Christ. When you're a part of the body of Christ, amen, when you're gone, I miss you. You may think that nobody recognizes that you're gone, but I see when you're not here. Amen. And I'm concerned. I'm not trying to run you down and all that kind of junk, but I'm concerned about you. And a pastor should do that. You should be concerned. And the leadership staff here, they're concerned about you. I know Deacon Richardson's concerned about you. I know Deacon Robertson. I know Alice and Ivy and Nalisha and my wife and, and, and Nessie. I know they're concerned about you. But we have meetings. We talk, about, man, where's so-and-so? We ain't seen them. Because we care. It's not we just trying to run you down and trying to be all in your business and stuff. 
I got enough business, amen. But I'm concerned. I care about you. I want what's best for your life, amen. So commit it to God's people. All right, number four, indicators of spiritual growth in my life. I am excited about the things of God. I'm excited about the things of God. And that's in verse 11 of Romans chapter 12. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Excited about the things of God. We can get excited about everything else. Amen? Amen? It amazes me how excited people get when they, there's a sports team that they like that makes it to playoffs or, or the championship or something. People get excited, but you come to church and you act like some, your dog died or something. You stand in there, you can't, you won't worship, you won't put, clap your hands, you won't do nothing. Stand there looking there with a mean look on your face. Where's your love? Where's your worship for God at? Where's your excitement? That's a sign that you're growing spiritually. When you saw that thing that's going on, um, don't waste your life. You should be like, man, a, another campaign. Praise God. An opportunity to go. An opportunity to get closer to Jesus. An opportunity for me to learn more. You should be excited about the things of God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. We sing this song. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known of all men. The Lord is near. You should be happy about God. Excited about the things of God. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Not, oh, Lord, it's sudden, man. I got to go to church again. They're going to be having me. That's a problem. How come I want to go to church? How come I want to be in God's presence? I, I want to be around the saints. Somebody that knows what I'm going through, because there are people out there have no idea what we're going through. Amen. Somebody that knows what the struggle is as far as Christianity is concerned. Somebody that understands uh, that one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to worship before his throne. Uh, somebody that knows what's happening in life and they know how it is when you're trying to do the right thing and everything is evil, is present. Somebody that's in the struggle with you trying to serve God because guess what? One day Jesus is coming back whether you're ready or not. I was glad, not I was mad, Elizabeth, <laughs> not I was mad when they said unto me, man, I got to get these kids up again. And some of the ladies, poor ladies, you got a bunch of girls, you got to do all their hair. <laughs> My wife used to say, I want all boys, I don't want to be doing nobody's hair. <laughs> Amen. But I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, not because of you. Sometimes people look at persecution, but it's a persecution of their own making. You're a terrible employee, but they say something to you. Oh, they just don't like me because I'm a Christian. No, they don't like you because your behind is lazy. <laughs> oh, man, they persecuting me because uh, uh, I got the, the Lord's Prayer on my desk. That's against company policy. If you work for a place and they tell you to do something or whatever, then you should obey the laws of that place. If you stand in and they tell you to say happy holidays, hey, you work for them. That's their policy. Now, when you leave, you can do whatever you want to do. That's not compromising. That's just being, being right and doing what's right. Just like you shouldn't be pulling people aside, taking three hours to witness to somebody, and your behind should be working. You're still in that time for that company. That's not right. Oh, they persecuted me. No, it's because of you. Sitting there reading the Bible, and you should be making calls to folks. That brings dishonor to God, not honor to Him. But when you go home, you land up uh, watching Martin Lawrence and all that kind of junk. No, your behind should be reading the Bible in. Am I, amen. Am I right about it? 
You might as well come to church. You're already here. Praise God. Amen. But when they say all kind of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now that last part, I was when I was looking at this and studying the whole thing, I was thinking about how, how I take so much flack because I preach what God wants me to preach. I'm going to tell you right now, some of the stuff that comes from behind the pulpit, it, it, but conviction is good. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction causes you to change. What did Jesus say about the truth? Know the truth and the truth of what? Make you free. Amen. You need to know the truth. When we were in Long Beach on vacation, me and my wife, we were sitting up. This guy ran by. He was jogging. He had his shirt off and stuff was flopping all over the place. And my wife said, that's how you look. He's got your same body type. I was like, what? I said, I look like that? She said, yeah. I said, I got to do something about this, man. <laughs> I didn't get hurt. I didn't get offended. I didn't get upset. And I ain't talking to you. I'm done. I want to go home. No. Truth is the truth. I ain't got it like I used to. Amen? But I embrace it. And I said, well, I'll do something about it. And it's the same way when something comes from behind the pulpit. And guess what? Let me tell y'all something. Remember this. I'm just a delivery boy. I'm just a mailman. You don't stand at the mailman at the mailbox with bat when the mailman comes. Or if this fool put another bill in my mailbox, I'm going to club him down. You don't do that, do you? Well, why would you do that to me? I'm just delivering what God said. That's all I'm doing. They used to have old saying, if you throw a brick over the fence, the dog to get hit is the one, the, is the one that's going to bark the loudest. So when people charge out the church mad and upset and all that kind of stuff, then that means it was for you, honey. And that's not, it's not a reason to get mad. Just change. Because the Bible tells me that when God loves you, he'll correct you. Amen? Aren't you glad that the Lord corrects you? Aren't you glad the Lord stops you when he sees you going down the wrong road? Aren't you glad when you're getting ready to fall into a hole and the Lord will say, hey, no, stop. Don't enter that way. Aren't you glad when God stops you? I'm glad. Amen. I've had my talking donkey experiences also. Like Bam did, amen. God has had to stop me from things before. And he will because he loves you. Amen. That's what church is. Church is a constant reminder of what we should be doing. Writing the tape, the, the, the laws of the Lord on our heart, having them in our mind, constantly meditating on his law, loving his law. Again, it don't always feel good, but God wants us to be more like Christ. Amen. So that's the third thing. Excited about the things of God. All right, number five. I'm using my gifts and my talents to serve the Lord. I'm using my gifts and talents to serve God. That's another indicator of spiritual growth. A lot of times people use their gifts and their talents to do what they want to do and make money. What about transferring that over to help the kingdom of God? Amen? Amen? Surely you can do something to help God's program advance. That's one of the reasons why I think our church isn't going like it should. There shouldn't be no empty chairs here. I think because if more people serve, God was okay, now they're ready for the increase. Because right now, there's only a few people that's doing everything. Amen? Can I get an amen, Deacon Robert? There's only a few people that's doing everything. Can I get an amen, Leroy? Amen. Can I get an amen, Lynette? Can I get an amen, Sister Mary? There's only a few people that's doing everything. Everybody else is a spectator. There's something you can do. Now, I'm not mad. Now, because sometimes people get a preacher, you ain't mad. I'm not mad. I'm just saying there's something you can do. I don't know about you, but I didn't like sitting on the bench when I played ball. No. Well, you hurt, you can't go back out there. No, tape it up. I can get back out there. I didn't like sitting on I didn't, I wanted, I didn't want to be a spectator. Give me something to do. It don't have to be the most grand uh, thing. It don't have to be a big thing. It don't have to be something extravagant. As long as you're doing something. 
I never liked to be that person that was always taking and never giving. Everybody had a friend like that, amen? You get in the car and you get ready to go somewhere, everybody bringing out gas, man, and here's old so-and-so. <laughs> oh, sorry, bro. <laughs> you always got that one. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And then family members that come to your house and they can eat up everything, don't bring nothing. And then they got the nerve to try to take a plate home with them. <laughs> bro, you ain't bring nothing. How you going to? <laughs> amen. Amen. But God wants us not to be spectators, but God wants us to be involved. And again, you don't have to do something big and extravagant, but do something. I'll, I tell y'all this all the time. God is industrious. You think you're going to get to heaven and be sitting on your boo ha ha and not doing nothing? God going to walk up in your house and say, hey, bro, what you doing? There's a universe to colonize. There's what, whatever he wants you to do. There's going to be something to do. We're not going to just fly on clouds all day and stuff. There's going to be something to do. <laughs> Amen. Because God's kingdom is a kingdom. Amen. There's going to be something to do. All right. So am I using my gifts and my talents to serve the Lord? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. As each one of you has received a special gift. I don't care what you say. You have a gift. It don't matter. Every person that's living, that God has created, has a gift. Not too long ago, I saw a documentary, and there was this guy that's, um, that's autistic. And the gift that he has, there's very few people on this earth that can do what this guy does. They took him, Mona, and they say he can, if he sees something one time, he can draw it. Don't matter what it is. They flew him over London, England, and he saw the picture, and he drew the picture down to details like people looking out the window and a cat on the ledge. He could remember all of that. A special gift. If you're living and breathing, you have a gift. The sad thing about it, Shay, is a lot of people will never discover it because they're not in God's will. You will never even discover what it is. And that's a sad thing to me. God created you for a purpose. You'll never know what it is because you're not in the will of God. Many people die not even knowing what their purpose is. You have a purpose for living. You know that. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. And a lot of times, Coco, your background is what determines what your purpose is. Because the pain that you have, you should not let that go to waste. Because you can help somebody. Amen? You can help somebody that lost a child. You can help somebody that has gone through a chemotherapy. You can help somebody that's on dialysis. You can help somebody that has a child that's trying to run away from home. You can help somebody that's suffering through depression. God get your life in order so you can help somebody else. Amen. That pain is not to be wasted. Am I using my gifts and my talents to serve God? As each of you have received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so and speaks the utterances of God. Whosoever serves, it is to do, I'm sorry, it is to do so as one who serves by strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when you do something, you should do it as unto the Lord. When you do it, do it right. Don't do a sorry job. Amen? And that's even as your work. That's a testimony and a testament to you. I tell you, I got called every name in the book because I wanted to do my work as unto the Lord. You think I care about them folk? Care about that. Them the same food that was got fired and laid off and stuff when they was talking trash about me that, that was talking about, oh, you kissing up to the man and you <laughs> look at it. Oh, look at Thomas. Ah, you think you, you can laugh all you want to. I do my work as unto the Lord. I don't care about what you say. See, that's the thing. I'm, I'm so beyond what people say. I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago. I don't care what you say. <laughs> I care about what he says. <laughs> Amen. And when you do and when you do things to please the Lord, the Bible says he'll even make your enemies to be at peace with you. 
So some of them jokes that were talking the most trash were the ones that was coming back apologizing. Amen? Some of the ones who were talking the most trash, when things go wrong in their life, they don't go to hypocrite Bob. They don't go who that, to that joker that's sleeping with everybody in the church. They come to me. Hey, preacher, hey, can you tell me how to get out of this situation? Can you pray for me? Amen? I remember when 9-11 happened, there was grown men coming to me in tears. Please pray for the country. I said, sure, I've been praying for it. Where you been? Man, I didn't see that, but amen. But are you using your gifts and talents to serve God, or are you just using them for yourself? Now, the Bible has a particular place where it talks about this, the parable of the talents. When Jesus talked about this, this, this man who was a, a businessman, he gave all of his servants a few talents and to see what they would do with it. You know that's reminiscent of what, what God is going to say to us when we stand before him, right? I gave you the ability to do this. What did you do with it? And at the end of it, there was some he called good and faithful. Amen? And there was some that he called wicked and lazy. Or let me be careful to say the right term, slothful. No, lazy. You understand that, Amen? <laughs> Folks oh, trying to talk all this theological jargon and stuff. No, you lazy. You wicked and lazy servant. Amen. We should be serving God. Not serving yourself. But find a way to use your gifts and talents to serve God. And that's what the class system is about. We have classes. The class 101, that's not just to look pretty on the screen to occupy time before we start church. We have these things to show you because a lot of times people don't know their spiritual gift. But if you go in those classes, you'll be like, wow, that is my gift. <laughs> Amen. That was some things I was shocked by. I was like, wow, that is my gift. But hey, but you'll never know if you want to be a part of what God is doing. Be a part of what God is doing in the church. Amen. All right, the last one. We're talking about indicators of spiritual growth in my life. The last one for this week. Amen. I'm, I, like I said, I'm not going to finish this. Um, the indicator of spiritual growth in my life. Number six, there is a constant increase in my prayer life. Your prayer life shouldn't be going down. It should be going up. You shouldn't be praying less. You should be praying more. Now, this is an indicator of spiritual growth because as you look around, there's so many things to pray for and pray about. And I've said this a thousand times. If you can't think of nothing else to pray for, please pray for me because I covet your prayer. I'll take it any way I can get it. Amen. If you can pray for me, I'll take it. Even if I make you mad, talk to the Lord about me. <laughs> what he'll probably do is say, you look in the mirror lately? <laughs> Amen. That's what he used to do to me when I used to complain about my wife. So me, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you go to the Lord complaining and stuff, she ain't doing this. She ain't doing that. The Lord said, well, what about you? How many times have I asked you to do certain things and you didn't complete the task? And I was like, okay, Lord. And then, hey, then you get the right attitude. Amen. But that should be a constant increase in your prayer life. James chapter, uh, um, chapter, what did she go Chapter 5, I'm sorry, James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, for, therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You know, I catch myself in my sleep praying. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, blessing these. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I do. I pray. I, I'm always praying. Got to. Because you can't make it. If you don't pray, you're not going to make it as a Christian. I'm going to tell you that right now. You're not going to make it. The devil will wash you out. It's only a matter of time. You're just hanging by thread. Prayer is what connects us to God. Tell me something else that connects us to God besides prayer. Prayer is your relationship with God. That's how you share what's happening. That's how you share what's going on. That's how you ask for help. That's how you call for reinforcements. That's how you ask God to do certain things on earth. I remember in seminary there was a preacher that said this statement, and I never forgot it. He said, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. 
So in other words, if you're not telling God about it, don't expect it to happen. Now, he can do it, but he still wants you to ask. Amen? And parents, you should be able to understand that. You know them kids hungry, but you don't want them to eat all the brownies. Ask me first. Hey, man, I bought these waters, these propel waters, and, um, and my youngest son, and that dude eats everything. Oh, my God. Everything. I'm talking about if, if, if it's not nailed down, he'll eat it. If it's a dead fly on the counter, he'll probably eat that, too. He put a, put a little ketchup on it or something. Amen. But this dude eats everything. I have to tell him, hey, bro, don't eat this unless you ask me because he'll eat all of it. And then they go to their room. My wife made the biggest mistake, I think, on planet Earth, Tell them they could eat in their room. Them jokers just take stuff and go up there, and you, where is it? You just find bags. <laughs> but whatever, I mean, I, I get it, whatever. And that's the thing, I don't trip, they playing ball and different things, so do, do your thing. But, um, but certain things, ask me first. It ain't nothing worse than you went to Popeye's and you ate that one, one, the leg of that two piece, and you come back for that thigh and you ready and your mouth is ready and you can just taste it and you open up that refrigerator. Who ate my chicken? <laughs> That's me, man. I, I'm a yeller. <laughs> Somebody ate my chicken. I don't want to hear it. And then uh, no, nobody knows who done it. Somebody ate it. I'm grabbing Joker. Let me smell your breath. Somebody ate my chicken. <laughs> Amen. What am I talking about? Amen. I'm having one of them old moments. Amen. <laughs> oh, rejoice in the pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the will of God in your life for you to be thankful. Even when they eat your chicken. Amen. Thank God that you got chicken for to eat. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But that's some indicators of spiritual growth. In our lives, we have to make sure that we constantly evaluate our spirituality. Amen? And always ask God for a higher walk with him. But there's things that are associated with that. With the higher walk, and as you get closer to God, God's going to demand more from you. I'm just going to tell you straight up. Sometimes people leave church because, they, because God's asking more of them. And they just ain't willing to do it. I think about that rich young ruler. I'm going to close with this. That rich, rich young ruler. He walked up to Jesus and he, wanted, he said, man, I want to follow you. I want to be one of your disciples. And Jesus told him to do something. Again, I always tell you, if you go to God, it's going to be something you don't want to do. That's how you know it's him. He said, take everything you have and, say, and, and give it to the poor. He was like, oh, uh -huh. he's like, I don't know if I can do that, Lord. I, but the thing is, when, you, when God makes a request for you from that, He's just trying to see where your heart really is. I think about Abraham when he told Abraham to kill his son. Sometimes God just wants to see where your heart is. And he was getting ready to do it, and the angel stopped him. No, don't do it. And there was a ram over there in the bush. I remember one time God dealt with me about being a, being a, um, a missionary to Haiti, and I was preparing. I was getting ready to go. But he just wanted to see where my heart was. But I was willing. And one of the things I always say, if I'm not willing, I'm willing to be made willing. Amen. We have to be able to, to be what God wants us to be. But those are some indicators of spiritual growth, and we should constantly seek to be closer to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, God, who are, I believe with all my heart, in desiring to grow closer to you. God, it's not always easy in the world that we live in. The constant bombardment of advertising and everything and competing for our attention. God, we don't want you to take the back seat. We want you to be at the forefront of our lives. Father, continually give us your word. Feed us with the word that's able to save our souls, God. We pray for that one who doesn't know Christ in this age. Father, we pray that you would move in their heart right now and that they would start this journey of the Christian faith. That being a disciple of Christ is one of the best things Once again, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for these indicators of spiritual growth. Let us desire to always be like you want us to be. We honor you and we give you.